And welcome back. Uh, welcome to Portland Bible Church. If this is your first visit, we're certainly glad to have you here. Uh, for many of us, we had a, an earlier service at 10 o'clock. We have 10 o'clock at 11.15. We're live on uh, Judy Glennie's Facebook page. That's where we started almost a year ago, and we've been at it ever since. Haven't missed a class. Three classes a week. We're nearly at, uh, if not already, up to about 150 classes. It's hard to believe uh, that it's been a year since we've uh, been out of our building down there in Portland. Uh, so I don't know. Maybe we'll have to stop calling it Portland Bible Church, but uh, so far that's what we still are, and so until we have a board meeting and decide on a different name, and uh, we'll work on that at a later time. So anyway, uh, welcome to Portland Bible Church, uh, as we say, in exile. We're meeting here at the Glenny Ranch at our house. We have many people who have joined us in person. We thank you for that as well as those who are joining us live streaming on Judy Glennie's Facebook page. Uh, we will have the material available at the website on YouTube after the fact. We're not able at this point to uh, live stream to that, but we're working on some alternatives, so just keep praying for that. We're uh, uh, constantly looking. I've talked to a number of different ministers, and uh, we've had some information from different churches doing different things, so uh, we're still kind of ahead of the curve in a sense because we haven't missed a class, and many of these have just started with uh, uh, live streaming and different uh, types of video presentations. So we thank the Lord that he's uh, honored our ministry here. And for all those who are listening, uh, not just in this area that are part of our local, local church, but those that are extended. We have people in California and Texas and Colorado and uh, even uh, I think there was one with Africa uh, and a couple places that uh, there was a pastor, I believe, in Africa uh, that uh, has his congregation listening. So we've got multiple people out there listening. So God is good. Uh, God is great. And he's provided so many things for us uh, to be thankful for. And so uh, we do have our class on Thursday, remember, at 7 o'clock. After the Thursday night class, we have about half hour, 40 minutes of prayer. So if you have prayer requests or praises, you can uh, give me a call or one of our board members and we'll get that information and that prayer request or praise on the prayer agenda. So uh, we thank you for that. And it's our custom as uh, we start each of our Bible classes for silent prayer to make sure that we're in fellowship. And of course, 1 John 1 tells, 1 John 1, 9 tells us, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This looks backward to the cross, the work of Christ that paid for every sin, past, present, and future. So we're basically uh, citing the court case of God the Father versus the human race. And Jesus Christ as our advocate has paid the price, the debt that we owe to the Father for our sin. And therefore we have fellowship one with the other and fellowship with God by being sure that we're in fellowship under the auspices and filling of the Holy Spirit. So we take time for that function uh, in silent prayer and then I'll close in audible prayer. Let us pray. Father, once again, we thank you for another day in this uh, beautiful land that we have, the United States. We thank you for the freedom that we possess to study your word in the way that you tell us to, and therefore that we would be edified of soul by studying these principles that we have before us today. We pray that uh, we would continue to have freedom so that we can disseminate your word, the gospel of your son, Jesus Christ, to all our congregation and all the extended family and those who join us literally from around the world. We thank you for that. Uh, we pray that uh, many people would share this message and it would get out, as well as all of my colleagues who are doing likewise. We thank you that there's a tremendous wave of presentation of the gospel and the truth about your son, Jesus Christ, and uh, uh, your word. Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for this time that we have. We pray now that you would encourage us by the things that we study, challenge and motivate us by these things. For we pray it all in Christ's name. Amen. Open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 4. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. Let my cry come before thee, O Lord. Give me understanding according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. Thy word is truth. 
study to show yourself approved unto God, workmen that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Again, open to Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 4. We noted the fact that these first five, four verses actually are part of one sentence. We noted the fact that in the Bible that you have before you, it's divided into chapter and verse. Sometimes the chapters and verses work, sometimes they don't. But of course, uh, the chapter divisions are not necessarily divinely inspired. They are simply for our finding passages together. Because if I told you I'm on page 336 in the New Testament, you have no idea where that would be. So this idea of chapter and verse has been edited into your Bibles uh, as a marvelous tool so that we can be on the same verse at the same time. Now granted, different translations may read slightly different, and that's okay. I use the New American Standard, which over the years, and this takes me back many, many years when I first got involved with Campus Crusade for Christ, when the New American Standard was the translation of the day. It's to, even to this day the most literal, the most accurate to the original language of any translation out there. Now, the New King James is a great translation, but I still prefer the New American Standard, although today it's harder to find those. You can probably find a New King James, and whatever translation you have, that's the one you you need to be using. Uh, Dr. Manfred Gutsky, one of the teachers that I had at uh, Campus Crusade, he's a, a fabulous teacher, and he said, the best Bible, I asked him, well, Dr. Gutsky, what's the best Bible? He said, the best Bible is the one you use. <laughs> and so it is. Uh, any Bible that you have, uh, there are certainly better translations, uh, New King James probably, and the New American Standard probably among the very best. Again, the New American Standard is very literal. Sometimes it sounds a little wooden. The King James and the uh, original King James, very nice, flows very nice. But there are some difficulties, some anachronisms and things like that. I know there are some churches who are King James only, uh, I guess their argument is, if it was good enough for Paul, it's good enough for me. But, of course, uh, it uh, wasn't because Paul wrote in the Koine Greek. And so if you want the original, it's not the King James or even the New King James or even the New American Standard. It's the Koine Greek uh, that is available for the New Testament, the Hebrew and Aramaic, and the Old Testament. And so this idea, King James only, to me, is just uh, one of those sad uh, deceptions that people have bought into. Nothing wrong with the King James. But uh, the one that you have is a good Bible, and we will edit and correct anything according to, not my wishes, but according to the language, and I give you that information. And if you want to take the time, you can go into a lexicon or an analytic concordance, and you can see what I'm saying is exactly what's there. If you want, I can teach you the Greek. I've taught first-year Greek, and I can give you a handle on New Testament Greek. So there's no secret to any of this. It's right there, but it has to be dug out. It's like treasure. Uh, it's that uh, pearl of great price, as it were, although the pearl of great price refers to the church, you and I. When we dig in Scripture, we're looking for the pearls of wisdom that God has placed there. Well, we're continuing the verse, and this is uh, really verse 1 of chapter 5, but it has four verses in it, and we're in verse 4, and it starts off again with the conjunction chi. In the Greek, that's K-A-I, which normally is translated as and. So whenever you see chi in the Greek, you learn the Greek word. It means and. But it can also mean other things depending on the context. Here it's a simple conjunction connecting the previous verses. And so we saw it in verse 4. Uh, rather, verse 3, and here again in verse 4, coupled together with 1 and 2. And so in this case, it says, and no one, no one takes the honor to himself. Well, right there is a whole sermon. Right there is a whole sermon. I won't do a whole sermon there, but mm -hmm. no one takes the honor to himself. We can put a period right there. Everything in this life, the honor that you have or ever have, is courtesy of God. If God doesn't promote you, you're not promoted. If God promotes you, you're promoted indeed, regardless of what other people think. And we saw that in a previous president who was promoted by God, we believe, even though many people were naysayers, not only before he became president, but all the way through his presidency, even to this day. And yet, I believe, as the scripture says, God promotes people into leadership, and he takes people out of leadership. And if God promotes you, you're promoted. And if God doesn't promote you, you're not promoted. This idea of self-promotion and telling everybody how great you are, of course, is basically a demotion as far as God is concerned. And people may think you're something when you're not, but eventually you'll be shown for what you really are. And so, better to wait 
for God to give you the honor and the promotion. So there's, there's an hour's worth of sermon right there. Uh, no one takes the honor to himself. God promotes, and he did with Aaron. He told Moses, take Aaron and his sons, and they will be promoted to the office of priesthood. Did it make them better than anyone else? Well, I'm sure that many of them thought they were better than everyone else because of their bad behavior. Uh, but uh, uh, that happens sometimes when people get into office. They think that they're better than the rest of us. We see it in Washington. Many of those people think they're better than the rest of us, and we're just a bunch of dummies out here, and they know everything because they are in the office. Same thing was true of the priesthood. And so they take an honor, sometimes warranted. Sometimes they have self-promoted to the place where they are uh, that was not really theirs to have. And so we see that happening in every sector of life. Here it has to do primarily with the priesthood. No one takes the honor of the priesthood to himself. Now, we don't take the honor of the priesthood because we are automatically priests by being in Christ Jesus, who's our high priest. But in Leviticus, uh, in the book of Leviticus and the Levitical system under the Aaronic priesthood, God promoted the priests. And of course, sometimes he took them out. There were occasions where priests were so bad that God killed them right on the spot. Fortunately, today, we don't have that with ministers. Uh, I sometimes, uh, I may, I'm glad because I've done some stupid things and God may have taken me out a couple of times, but there's some ministers out there that I think, God, couldn't you remove that one? Uh, strike that from the record, Lord. And he knows and he leaves them here. So he doesn't take them out like he did in the Levitical priesthood when they are really terrible. Sometimes he left them in because the people were so bad. And so when you have bad leadership, as they did with the priesthood occasionally, he left them in because they were, they were receiving what they deserved. And sometimes I think our leadership in this country is now what we deserve because of the evil that has come upon us. Same thing happened in Israel. The leaders sometimes were so bad and the people were just as bad. And God said, I'm done with you. I'm finished. And uh, we see that in 721 for the northern kingdom going out under Assyria and the captivity and uh, 586 BC when the temple was finally destroyed and they were taken into captivity in Babylon. <laughs> We've studied that in the book of Daniel and elsewhere. So we see that honor is given by God. Prime example of a Gentile was Nebuchadnezzar. He stood up after uh, Daniel had this great prophecy that he was the lead of the Gentile nations uh, from 586 all the way to the end of the future tribulation. We're in the Gentile era. And eventually, of course, even in tribulation will be the times of the Gentile until Christ returns. And that started with the head of gold. And, he, and Daniel said, you, Nebuchadnezzar, you are that head of gold. And immediately, I think that's all he heard. I am the head of gold. I am the golden head. And later, of course, he's standing on the, the parapet and he said, I look what I've created, this whole empire of Babylon. And that day God struck him down and he had, was like an animal for seven years eating grass and his hair growing long and his nails growing long. And he was a nutcase. But amazingly, God delivered that nation and the administration under Daniel and others was so strong that it made it through without a king, as it were, Nebuchadnezzar, for that seven years. And at the end of that time, he looked up to heaven and basically said, what am I doing? <laughs> and he recognized the most high God, and I believe that he became a believer in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Daniel's God. And he became a believer. So God struck him down. So we don't have to promote ourselves. God promotes and he demotes. And then he restores those who return to him. So there's my sermon on this one. And uh, hopefully it didn't take a whole hour. So that's the first part. It says, no one takes the honor to himself, but receives it when he is called by God, even as Aaron was. Now he goes back and speaks about the Aaronic priesthood. We've already seen the verse where Moses was told by God to take Aaron and consecrate him. And of course, they had special clothing made, uh, and the priests, his sons, they had clothing. And so the priesthood wore particular garments. They're called holy array. Uh, Judy and I were discussing this yesterday, how we have deteriorated so much today in worship at the church. In Israel, everybody came in their best clothes possible. The priesthood were dressed, as it were, to the nines. The high priest had a special uh, vestment, and he had the, uh, the table or the, the, tw the uh, 12 stones on his chest there, the breastplate of the high priest. All of these things, and the turban, and, and the jewels, and the ermine thummim on his shoulders, and all of these things. And today, 
You go to local churches and pastors come in their shorts and tank tops and sleeveless and no tie and no jacket, sloppiness, people coming in all manner of things, coming in to church with flip-flops. Now, I don't care how you come to church, but the point is that the scripture spoke about Israel. They came in holy array. That means you get yourself together. I remember my father, when we went to church, we never went to church that he didn't have a tie and coat and that I, as his son, didn't have a tie and coat. My mother, of course, in those days, ladies wore gloves and hats and uh, some of them wore veils, all sorts of things, but they came dressed to the nines, as it were, for church. My father even dressed like that when he went downtown on a Friday night. He wouldn't think of going out there in shorts and a tank top and flip-flops. Can you imagine back in the 50s? Just never happened. Oh, and I forgot, he had an appropriate chapeau. Nice little hat there as well. And so today, anything goes. I think that's, that's sad because, you know, you dress to the appropriateness of the occasion. Some people say to me, Pastor, why do you always wear a tie and a coat? It's appropriate. It's part of the position that I need to stand out as an example, Paul says. Let me be an example of Christ to the congregation. Follow Paul's example as he followed Christ. And I'm trying to follow Paul as he followed Christ. And therefore, I think it's important. Shine shoes, tie and coat, because it's appropriate to the ministry. Oh, I know some ministers have these uh, special kind of garb. I don't think there's any biblical basis. We're not in the Levitical priesthood. We just wear what's appropriate to our day of a professional person. I remember when I first started teaching school, I used to go with a tie and coat on. And I noticed I was the only one. Everybody said, why do you dress up? Well, because when I was a boy going to school, all of the men wore tie and coat. Sometimes they'd take it off during the class to teach because they don't want to get chalk all over themselves. They used to have blackboards, you remember, not uh, overheads and uh, uh, PowerPoint and all that. Even when I went, we had whiteboards. But, you know, so finally I, I, you know, I took my jacket off. Finally, I took my tie off. But I always had a nice collared shirt. Uh, so I just kind of was part of the congregation of, pe of, of teachers at, at school. But it just seems we've dumbed down the appearance. There is an appropriate attire, I believe, for church. We had a friend many years ago, we were in the gym, and this fellow had been in the army. And he came into the gym and he had on his fatigues. Back then they were kind of uh, the army green, olive drab, we call it, remember that? Some of you were in the army. And he came in with his fatigues on. I go, what are you doing? He said, I'm going to work out. I said, like that? He said, sure. I said, don't you have any sweatpants or anything? Well, these are good enough. It's, these will last forever. I go, I know they'll last forever, but this is the gym. You wear sweatpants and a, a T-shirt, maybe with the logo and a, and a sweatshirt and some, some uh, lifting shoes or sneakers. And he came in there with his dress shoes, his uh, army, com he came with combat boots oh. and his fatigues. And, I, and he said, well, what's the big deal? I said, it's the gym. When you're in the army, driving a tank, uh, running against the enemy, doing calisthenics, you wear fatigues. When you come here, you wear gym clothes. <laughs> this is the gym. Number of reasons. If you're trying to do squats or bend over, uh, those fatigues don't allow for that. Nice stretchy sweatpants do. I'm making a point here that you dress appropriately for the occasion. And I think today we're losing that everywhere. I've been in churches where I see pastors with straggly, stringy hair, unshaven uh, t-shirts or jeans with holes in them. Does this, does this give glory and honor to the Lord Jesus Christ? I think not. Now, maybe I'm harping on something here. I guess I am, but it's just something that grieves me. And I, to this day, I have people say, Pastor, you don't have to wear a coat and tie. Yes, I do. I'm setting an example here. I feel more professional when I come with coat and tie. Is there anything wrong with that? I think there's an appropriateness. When I go out in my garage right now and work out, uh, I, I don't go out with jeans. I go out with my sweatpants and t-shirt and my appropriate shoes and my weightlifting belt, and it's in the gym. When I come in the house, then I change into my regular clothes. So holy array is what I'm getting at here. And uh, it says here that uh, this is Aaron. He was called by God. Well, not much else here. And I got off onto the array, holy array there. It says, and not anyone takes the honor. The honor is value, responsibility, the office, uh, the place of honor for himself, but rather the one being called by God. In other words, here we have the verb kaleo, where we get our English word call. It's the invitation. Now, what if Aaron said, nah, not going to do it? 
He could have said no, but uh, he was called by God through Moses to be the high priest, and he was, and his sons were. And so we are called. We are called to believe in Jesus Christ. Some say, no, nope, not going to do it. Others of us say, I believe in Jesus Christ. You accept the call. Then you are entered into a category called the elect. We are the elect in Christ once we accept the call. So here it is, the fact that this individual or the priests are being called. It's the passive voice. The passive voice in a verb in the Greek particularly means that you receive the action. You do not make the action. You accept and so one being called by God. Present tense indicates that uh, this was something that was ongoing through the Levitical system and the Aaronic priesthood. The participle, again, indicates ongoing throughout the line of Levi all the way, believe it or not, into the millennial kingdom. The Levitical priesthood, they may not even know who they are during the dispensation of the church, but in the tribulation, 144,000 Jewish people will be from each of the tribes, including the tribe of Levi, and they will continue on into the millennial kingdom, those who are believers in Jesus at the end of the tribulation, and there will be Levitical priests, and there will be of a special line of the Levitical priests called the line of Zadok, and so the Zadokian priesthood will be the ones who officiate in the temple itself to offer sacrifices in memorial. So this idea of being called is participle because it's ongoing. God continues to call priests. In fact, if you like, we've been called to be priests. Every single one of us, not only is a saint set apart unto God, but we are called a priest, and we have a high priest, Jesus Christ, after the order of Melchizedek. I can't make it any clearer. We're called by the God. The definite article with theos indicates one of the three members of the Trinity, and obviously God is the one doing the calling. And then it says, uh, this individual receives it, even as indeed Aaron. So whether it's Jesus Christ, or whether Aaron, or Jesus Christ, or each one of us, we're all called. We're invited. You can say no, and that's what many people do. Every member of the human race gets an invite, but not every member of the human race accepts the invitation to believe in Jesus Christ. And so uh, this, of course, we see, for example, back in Numbers. Let's take a look. Uh, Old Testament here, corroboration, Numbers chapter 16. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers 1640. Starting in verse 39, So Eliezer the priest took the bronze censer, which the sons were who were burned had uh, I'm sorry censers which the men who were burned had offered and they hammered them out as a plating for the altar as a reminder and what happened here is that there were people offering who should not have and so you got to read the whole thing to get that and in verse verse uh, uh, let's see where did I go verse forty it says as a reminder to the sons of Israel that no layman who is not of the descendants of Aaron should come near to burn incense before the Lord, that he might not become like Korah and his company. Remember Korah and his company? That was when they had the Exodus and they made the golden calf, Operation Golden Calf, and they talked to Aaron into making it. And of course, when Moses came down from the mountain, they were destroyed and an earthquake opened the earth and swallowed them. Everyone who was not faithful to Aaron, or rather to Moses, and the uh, and the Lord. And so here it says, uh, when they grumbled in verse 40, uh, Korah and his company, just as the Lord had spoken to him through Moses. But on the next day, all the congregation of the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron, saying, you are the ones who have caused the death of the Lord's people. Moses didn't cause the death. The Lord disciplined those who had brought strange fire in. Uh, we see this uh, go over to Numbers 18.7. Numbers 18.7. Then the Lord spoke to Aaron. Now behold, I myself have given you charge of my offerings, even all the holy gifts of the sons of Israel. I have given them to you as a portion and to your sons as a perpetual allotment. Good, bad, or indifferent. So the Levitical priests, some of them were really rats. And God took many of them out. Here was an example in chapter 16. And uh, uh, they have others 
that could be cited, and we'll look at one other one here just in a moment. But obviously, the perpetual priesthood goes not only through the time of the Old Testament. Uh, it is set aside through the church age, but it'll be reinstituted in the tribulation and all through the millennial kingdom. Today, we have a special priesthood from Pentecost to the rapture of the church. It's kind of an insertion. We call it the intercalation, the insertion of the dispensation of the church from Pentecost to the rapture. Then it reverts back to the time of Israel during the time of tribulation. All right, that's that. Let's go over for just for a quick one here uh, to Second Chronicles. We're going to be looking at uh, Chronicles and uh, Samuel and the Kings coming up in our study on leadership and our Thursday night study after we finish the Millennial Kingdom, a brief. Second Chronicles, chapter 26, 14. <clears throat> chapter, Second Chronicles 26, 14. <clears throat> Here we have Uzziah. Uzziah was a, a king. And uh, uh, moreover, Uzziah, verse 14, Second Chronicles 26. And it says, Uzziah. <clears throat> king prepared for all the army shields, spears, helmets, body armor, bows, and sling stones. And in Jerusalem he made engines of war invented by skillful men to be on the towers of the corners for the purpose of shooting arrows and great stones. Didn't have any uh, uh, 45s or, you know, get any kind of uh, weapons that we think of. Hence his fame spread far, and he was marvelously helped until he was strong. But Oh, I hate when they use that word, but as <clears throat> many connotations. But when he became strong, aha, uh -huh, God uses people who have weakness. Jesus Christ became weak. He identifies with our weakness. Paul says, let my weaknesses be strengthened by Christ. But he became strong and his heart was so proud that he acted corruptly. And he was unfaithful to the Lord his God. For he entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. Well, he was a king. He was not of the tribe of Levi. Violation of not man's law, but God's law. Okay? And so uh, <clears throat> then uh, Azariah the priest entered after him and with him 80 priests of the Lord, valiant men, and they opposed Uzziah the king and said to him, It is not for you, Uzziah, <coughs> pardon me, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated, that is called, obviously, to burn incense. Get out of the sanctuary, for you have been unfaithful and will no longer have honor from the Lord. But Uzziah, with his censer in his hand for burning incense, was enraged. The arrogant are often like this. When they're called on their uh, error, they simply go full steam ahead with that error. It's that insanity we were talking about, that believing the lie. Well, I'm the king after all. And it says that, uh, 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 that uh, let me finish this. And while he was enraged with the priests, leprosy broke out on his forehead before the priests in the house of the Lord beside the altar. And Azariah the chief priest and all the priests looked at him and behold, he was leprous on his forehead and they hurried him out of there. And he was also hastened to get out because the Lord had smitten him. And King Uzziah was a leopard to the day he died. God has a very dim view of people who violate his laws. Old Testament, church age, kingdom. So beware when we take things for granted and just go casually about with regard to the Lord. And he was a leper. So sometimes, I'm not saying always, sometimes illness comes upon us as discipline. Not always. Sometimes it comes as a, something the Lord wants to heal and use to his glory. So there are many reasons for suffering. We've studied that in the past. But sometimes discipline comes in the form of suffering uh, because of uh, bad judgment and sins. And it says here that uh, uh, Uzziah was a leper till the day of his death, and he lived in a separate house, being a leper, for he was cut off from the house of the Lord. And Jotham, his son, was over the king's house, judging the people of the land. And the rest of the acts of Uzziah, first to last, the prophet Isaiah, 
uh, Isaiah and the sons of Amos has written. And then he slept with his father and he was buried with his fathers in the field of the grave which belonged to the kings for they said he is a leper. What Would you like that on your tombstone? This guy was a leper. <clears throat> Why? Disobedient to the Lord. And Jotham, his son, became king in his place. Now, a lot of wonderful stories. Uh, that's a sad one in the Old Testament, in the uh, uh, area of the kings and chronicles. And so we have that. Also, uh, while we're there, one last one over in 1 Chronicles 23, 13. And we'll be done. 1 Chronicles 23. Most people don't go in the Old Testament much. We're going to be doing quite a bit in the Old Testament on Thursdays after we finish the Millennial Kingdom A brief. 23, 1 Chronicles 23 and 13. The sons of Amran were Aaron and Moses. Amran and Jochebed, remember that was uh, when they had the exodus and Moses was uh, weaned by the daughter of Pharaoh. You remember the story, he was put in the basket. Well, his, uh, his father was Amran. And uh, it says here, and uh, Amran, uh, the sons were Aaron and Moses. And Amran was set apart to sanctify him as most holy, he and his sons forever, to burn incense before the Lord, to minister to him, and to bless in his name forever. I like that word forever. In the Old Testament, it's olam. In the New Testament, it's I own, sometimes I own, pros, I own, I, forever and forever. But uh, forever is forever, whether it's forever and forever. It's a long time at the very least. And usually in the Old Testament, olam refers to for the rest of eternity or certainly the rest of human history. Okay, back to Hebrews 5.5. 5. Once again, the writer of Hebrews is going to quote the Old Testament. He's going to quote verses we've already covered. So those people say, well, uh, the writer of Hebrews, you keep repeating yourself, obviously. And he's going to do it again and again and yet again. It is how we learn. We learn by, repetitious, by repetition, by being repetitious. So it starts off, so also, new sentence, verse 5, so also, so also Christ did not glorify himself so as to become a high priest, but he who said to him, he, that's God the Father. So here we have, and I'm not going to go through the verses here, but we do have uh, 11 references to the priesthood and the high priest, as we noted earlier. And they basically started in chapter 2, 17, 3, 1, 4, 15, 4, 14, and 15, and here. So 1, 2, 3, 4, this is the fifth reference uh, out of these 11 references that is going to speak about the high priest as being Jesus Christ. So he is the high priest. There's no high priest such as some denominations or cults suggest there is a priesthood and a certain person in charge of that priesthood. Jesus Christ is the high priest now and forever. So also the Christ. Definite article indicates we're talking about Jesus Christ. The Christ. In the Greek, it simply says Christ. See, in the New American Standard, they just capitalize Christ, therefore you know it's Jesus. But in the Greek, it's a lot clearer because it has a definite article. The Christ, the one and only, unique Jesus Christ. The Christ. Did not glorify. We have the word doxazo, from which we get doxology. The doxology is the uh, word or mention of glory, the discussion or the praise of glory. We have the doxology sometimes at the end of a service or the beginning of a service in some denominations. We've used it occasionally ourselves. So uh, doxazo means to glorify. Here we have the aorist tense. At the point of time that Christ came into human history, he didn't glorify himself. He waited for the Father to glorify him. And on the Mount of Transfiguration, we had a picture of that glory to come as he flashed it. And the three who were there, Peter, James, and John, they saw the transfiguration. And what happened? Well, Peter got a little ahead of himself. Oh, we need to make a temple here for you and, uh, and Elijah and Moses. And, uh, and the father says, be still. <laughs> Stifle, Peter. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. That was a flash of the Shekinah glory of Jesus Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration. And that's when he had the glory shown that he always had, but now his humanity was going to have it. And at the resurrection, he would have that glory restored to him in his humanity, which he always had in his deity. So also the Christ did not glorify himself uh, in human history, but 
to be uh, to become a high priest, but also the one speaking to him. The one speaking to him, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Well, we got a lot to say here. I don't know if we'll have enough time, but we'll see. Uh, again, the one speaking to you is the God the Father. We have a particular verb called uh, uh, the one that is communicating. There are two words for speaking. One is lego, kind of like the little toy blocks, and laleo. I always liked laleo because first year Greek, that was like laleo, sound like birds chirping. And so the difference, Lego, you said it, la leo means you really got it across. La leo means to communicate, and God is the one speaking, and he uses la leo. And so the one who is speaking, la leo, we have the aorist tense, indicates the time of the transfiguration. To him, you are my beloved son. Uh, today I have begotten you. Well, did he beget him at the transfiguration or at the virgin birth? Or an eternity past when he sent him into human history. Every one of those in God's eyes is today. In eternity past, it's today. He begot Jesus Christ as the revealed member of the Trinity. At the virgin birth, that's today. That's when he became a human being as well as undiminished deity. And at the transfiguration, that was today. Every one of those is the ever-present <laughs> eternal today. And he says, my son, today... I have begotten you, singular. Uh, the word son occurs 12 times in the book of Hebrews. I think all of them portray the Lord Jesus Christ. We won't go through them. We'll see them as they come. We've already seen them in chapter 1, verse 2, 5, and 8. Chapter 2, 6. Chapter 3, 6. Chapter 4, 14. And here, chapter 5, 5. And on and on, all the way through to chapter 10, 29. We have the word son, son, son. Now, we know that Jesus Christ in his humanity was the son of Joseph, not the genetic son, because he was born of the virgin. But he was the son of God, not that God had a wife. I think there's a cult out there that says God and his wife, you know, uh, Elohim and his wife, no such thing. God doesn't have a wife. The wife of God was Israel. He said they were his wife. And Christ will take a bride. That's the church. And so here, my son is a technical term designating the second member of the Trinity because a son is responsible to the father. The father instructs the son. There's that relationship, father-son, in human history, which allows us to understand what God's talking about. Just as I am a son of my father and my child is the son of myself, so God says, I have a relationship. I'm the authority. I give that authority to my son. In fact, after the resurrection, after the crucifixion and the payment of debt, Jesus Christ was given all judgment. All judgment has been given to the son. By whom? By the father. Now, I know this is hard because all three members of the Trinity are co-equal and co-eternal as God. But they have individual responsibilities. The father plans. The son executes. The Holy Spirit reveals and restores. So the Son has a subordinate position to the Father. On earth in his humanity, he said, not my will, but the Father's. And he appealed to the Father in prayer. Uh, he said to the disciples, you want to learn how to pray? Our Father who art in heaven. Jesus prayed to his Father. There's a responsibility, a chain of command. That's what the Son represents. It's a technical term for chain of command and responsibility of the Son to the Father and the Father's authority over the Son. All right, we've done that before. So there's 12 references to the Son. Today, we've done that as well. Uh, we see that uh, quotation. This very quotation comes out of Psalm 2-7. Uh, hold the place. We've been there. We've studied this psalm in detail. But let's go back to Psalm 2, 7. Psalm 2, verse 7. I will surely tell the decree of the Lord. The decree of the Lord. He said to me, Thou art my son. Today I have begotten thee. Well, this is before the transfiguration. This is before the virgin birth. When was this? In eternity past. David reveals this in Psalm as a past act. This must refer to eternity past. When the father said, Today I have begotten you. 
Uh, the word begotten we'll have to take a look at, but there it is. And then the other times that we see it, we see this quoted exactly in Acts 13.33. Look at Acts 6, uh, 13. 13. Not many times, actually, this phrase, but it's quoted here. So Psalm 2.7, now Acts 13 and verse 33. God fulfills his promises to our children at that he raised up Jesus as it was also written in the second Psalm. Gee, Luke understands his Old Testament. Can you imagine a church age saint recognizing the Old Testament, the importance of it? And so the Lord wrote this in the second Psalm. Thou art my son. Today I have begotten thee. Wow. So it's okay for a teacher of the Word of God to refer to the Old Testament. Thank you very much, Luke. Appreciate that, as well as the writer of Hebrews, of course. So Acts 13, 33 from Psalm 2, 7. And, of course, we saw it earlier in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 5. So here's the writer of Hebrews keeps repeating himself. Thank you. I wish I knew who it was. The writer of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews, we don't know. I should call him Apollos, but that's my opinion. And uh, the scholars are divided about 13 different people. I still opt for Apollos. He was a biblical scholar, and uh, Paul uh, recognized it, and he was clarified on the Holy Spirit and the work of the Holy Spirit, ministry of the Holy Spirit, by uh, 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 Pris Prisca and Aquila. So at any rate, we have here verse uh, one, 5. Chapter 1, verse 2, for 2, which of the angels did he ever say? Well, this is back prehistory, huh? When the angels back in the day, what did, did he ever say to the angels, Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee? And a whole host of quotations we noted in chapter 1 all the way down through verse 13. We have everything there except our verse uh, that uh, we just uh, looked at here uh, order, after the order of Melchizedek, which just now occurred. But here we have it back there in Hebrews 1.5. So these verses, Psalm 2.7, Acts 33.13, Hebrews 1.5, and Hebrews 5.5. 5, four times. Today, the eternal today, I have begotten you. Now this word begotten. I had a colleague of mine uh, sent me a note, said, would you do a little bit with this word begotten? What does that mean? Well, here it is, friend, uh, my pastor colleague, uh, uh, for you, uh, the idea of begotten. Remember in John 3, 16, the only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him uh, would not perish but have everlasting life. Uh, God has given his only begotten. What does begotten mean? Well, it's a King James word. Uh, it comes from the Greek word ginomai, G-I-N-O-M-A. A-I, ginomai, and it means to be born, means to be produced, it means to become something that you weren't, so it doesn't necessarily have to be born, to come into being, to arrive, or to be established. I like the word established. Today I have established you uniquely, have begotten you. Now, this idea of uniquely born we find uh, in other passages we noticed in John 3 16 where he is the only born for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son now the best translation for that would be for God so loved the world that he gave his uniquely appointed son uniquely appointed. Now, I know you could say uniquely born because the virgin birth was a unique birth, so it certainly works on a physical level. Level Jesus Christ was uniquely born, and he was the Son of God because the Holy Spirit impregnated Mary. So in that level, he was uniquely born, but I like it here, uniquely established or uniquely uh, uh, put into position. So there's three meanings that we can use. One is appointed, he was appointed by the Father in eternity past. Will you go into human history and do the work of salvation? And Jesus said, I'll do it. And the Holy Spirit raised his hand, and the Father raised his hand, and Jesus said, I'll make it unanimous. I'll go into human history in the incarnation. And so he was appointed in eternity past today. Appointment. The only appointed one. Secondly, prophetically, it's looking at the incarnation. When he came into human history, he certainly was uniquely born virgin birth, uniquely appointed. John said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 
uniquely appointed to this task of messianic salvation. So number two, prophetically, it looks at the incarnation, the virgin birth. All right. And then, of course, we see it periodically, such as in the book of Hebrews, where it's a reference to either one of those in eternity past or to the virgin birth. Or point three, we might say that he was recognized by God the Father in the transfiguration. This is my beloved son. Now, he didn't say only begotten there, but he said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So we might say even there, the idea of uniquely appointed, this is the one. And he said, what? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And the following sentence, if you look there, says what? Listen to him. Boy, those are the words. Listen to him. That was to Peter, James, and John, but that could be since it was today. It's today. Uh, and so to us, listen to him, Jesus Christ, the uniquely born son. So in, in John 3, 16, monogenes is only born is how it's translated. I would say uniquely born or uniquely established, uniquely appointed, one of a kind. The word mono means unique or one. Uh, we talk about monorail. It's one rail. Mono means one. It's unique. It's one. And so one established person that is jesus christ the only begotten means uniquely established or appointed if you like for the virgin birth uniquely born by the virgin birth now we see this concept of only begotten uh the word uh, son uh, in john three sixteen. we've seen that uh well, we've got a couple of minutes here but i've got to go quickly look at hebrews 11 17 in 11.17, it says in verse 17, this is in the faith chapter, by faith Abraham, when he was tested, notice there it doesn't even say tempted, it says tested, he passed the test, tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten now there it's his physical son so there the word begotten in the context indicates that he is his physical son abraham's physical son by sarah and so we see some places it refers to the physical son but more often than not it refers to uniquely born person of jesus christ in uh, three places in luke 7 and uh, 12 8 42 and 9 36 it does not refer to jesus christ as it does not here in hebrews eleven seventeen. but in john 1 14 18 3 16 and 3 18 as well as first john 4 9 it refers to Jesus Christ. And as we close out, look over quickly to 1 John 4.9. 1 John 4.9. By this, the love of God was made manifest in and through us that God has sent his uniquely appointed son. It says only begotten, see? That's monogenes, his uniquely appointed born or uniquely appointed designated son into the world so that we might live through him and then he defines love in in this is love not that we love god but that he first loved us and sent his son as a satisfaction a propitiation an expiation for our sins well that's all we got time for today and so we pick it up in verse six of hebrews chapter five next time father once again we thank you so much for your word that lives and abides forever. We thank you for the passages that we've been able to consider, looking at Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith, who has become perfected through his humanity and his death on the cross, and therefore satisfying the Father's just demand that the sins of humanity be paid for. And because of that, we can have everlasting life simply by faith in your son, Jesus Christ, finished work on the cross. He died for all the sins of all members of the human race once and for all. That's it. It's done. All we need to do is to believe in that finished work. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his uniquely appointed and born son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Won't you do it before you leave? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ 
and you will be saved. Father, thank you for this opportunity we've had. We pray that we would store up these principles in your word of God and that they would give us confidence in your son, Jesus Christ, and the hope for the future that we will share with him for millennia to come. Thank you for these things, Father. We pray all this in Christ's powerful and matchless name. Amen.